Uh, my name is Roque Akinbilira, and um, I've worked in a, a, a good number of HR spaces um, within different organizations. So when I got this topic, managing team dynamics for um, improved performance within organizations, the first thing I thought about was where do I start? Because it's a huge topic. And I put this other small part because it's a guide. It's not, um, what's it called now? The, the foolproof way to manage uh, effective teams because different team dynamics require different ways of management. So what this will be would be a guide, uh, some sort of framework within which you can situate your team and then manage them accordingly. So next, we'll be talking about content. Oh, and uh, one of the things I like to do with my slides is, uh, because I'm a visual and audio learner, I like to put a lot of graphics into it. So sorry if it bothers you, please just dim your screen so that you know it, it doesn't really, the colors will pop from time to time. All right, so team dynamics. Um, we'll talk about our objectives, understanding team dynamics. I'm sure we can all read this, so I will not spend too much time going through all of this. So let's get into the meat of the matter. Understanding team dynamics. And when I think about teams, I think about sports teams because they have evolved to be some of the most efficient teams in the world. But I will not be using too many sports analogies, so don't worry, you will not be lost in the conversation. But it is good to understand the basics of team dynamics. What, what exactly is team dynamics? I mean, I may be wrong in my assumption that team dynamics is how we interact with one another. Are there deeper meanings to team dynamics or is it just surface level conversations and interactions? So let's go. So explore strategies for managing team dynamics within organizations to enhance performance. Every organization is made up of teams and the point of coming together as a team is performance. Plain and simple. So if a team is, a, is not performing, then the team doesn't have a reason to exist. So I will be looking at how highly effective teams work because when a team is effective, then we're able to enhance performance. Um, I will not probably be going through my slides word for word, but I'll also just try to chip in some of the experiences that I've had over time. Team, team dynamics are, they can be conscious or unconscious. And what starts to happen when people begin to interact is there will be friction. So either creative friction or the, the negative toxic friction, there will always be friction. Even children who are raised in the same house have varying opinions. So not to talk of people who are full grown adults and are now sharing a space or having to do work together. So whether we like it or not, there will be some sort of friction or conflict or, or interaction required to maintain team dynamics. So uh, in some cases, you know, there can be bad team dynamics and good dynamics, and we'll be looking at that shortly. But why is it important to focus on team dynamics? Because strong teams produce strong results, and weak teams, well, produce nothing at all. And so um, I, I don't want to bore you with statistics or the numbers because I know that um, a good portion of us research or we can always find those things online. So my focus will be on things that will instantly add value and are practical tips that we can work with. So what does a good team look like? What does a bad team look like? Typically, it, it, it boils down to three basic things on both sides. So a good team has strong leadership, encourages collaboration, and they're able to yield better results because they work in sync. There's synergy. But for a bad team, there's weak leadership, usually, and weak leadership does not necessarily mean the person is passive. The person could be passive aggressive. The person could be toxic. So weak leadership is not necessarily a matter of physical strength as it is a matter of the way that the team is run. Then also bad teams have good things. A lot of people assume that hiring similar people within a team 
is an efficient way. You know, it cuts down on the conflict. Everybody's always on the same page. We are great and we get work done. But I have seen over time that teams that have people that are too similar are not as efficient as teams that have diverse team members. So the, the subject of group think is a limiter than an enhancer of team performance. And I have seen over and over again in different organizations how managers tend to hire people who think like them, who act like them, who, in quotes, are of the same pedigree as them. But what you have denied your team of is that creative tension that allows us to come up with innovative ideas, ideas that are not necessarily run off the mill or that are not typical to a group of people that look like us. So I'll give you an example. I, I, I um, joined a team, uh, it's a corporate communications team, and I'd been in the team only six months, and the leader of the team was leaving, and I was told to step in. Now, I had people who had been in that team for over a year, much longer, and there were opinions about different people in the team. So we had this particular person on the team that she always had an opinion on everybody else's work. And she was not necessarily subtle in the way she passed it. So people were either afraid of her or just didn't want to work with her. And the first advice or part of the first advice I got in taking on the leadership of that team was, you know what, I think you should let this person go. But my thoughts were, if I let this person go, I will be denying off the creative genius that this person can come up with. So what we need to do is channel this person's strength in a way that it is productive and helpful for the team. And so what I tried to do was to give her tasks that were more in tune with her areas of strength. So she's a good critic. So quality assurance. She's, she's quite vocal about the way she thinks and she always like thinks left when everybody's thinking right. So when we have brainstorming sessions, I want to hear her voice because it usually nudges us or helps us to look at a perspective that we otherwise would not have considered. And, you know, after years of working with her, she was an invaluable member of my team because I loved the fact that she was able to disagree with me, but still logically put her point within context. Now, I'm not saying go and disagree with everybody. No, that's not the point. But if you have a stronger, more logical argument, if you have a more compelling story, then as a leader, you should be willing to listen because then it opens up doors for creativity. All right, so then, Blocking behaviors. So people that are overtly critical of others, like the person I just mentioned, but were channeling her energy in a different direction. It moved from being overtly critical of others to being a valuable critique of the ideas within the team. So again, matter of perspective, not participating in discussions. Some people are just done. Like quiet quitting is a thing. And they're like, you know what? Um, you said I'm going to be part of this team. I'm going to be part only in name. I will not contribute a thing. Then recognition seeking. Those who are always attention seekers, who are like, yeah, this is what I did. This is what I did. This is what I did. Focusing on themselves and not the team goals. Then also interrupting sessions by making jokes at inappropriate times. Now, secondary school, it's okay to have a class clown in secondary school. Even in university, sometimes it's cute. But in the workplace, you cannot be known as the class clown. And even if you want to apply humor, apply it in a, let me use the words in air quotes, responsible manner. Because you have to be respectful of other people, their time, the work they put in, and their contributions as well. So you cannot just go about interrupting and then making jokes when it's not even appropriate. So disagreeing with everyone's idea except their own. There are those ones who believe that they are the best things in sliced bread. And you're just like, I don't understand. I, I agree that your parents told you you were special when you were growing up, but, but 
can you turn it down for the workplace? Right, okay, so let's move on really quickly. Now, I find that this matrix can be applied with any team performance um, KPI. So I'll give you an example. I'm using bond and performance. But in some cases, you can use communication and performance. You can use performance and synergy. You could, so different team dynamics will play out if you use the simple line graph. I think that's what it's called. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know too many mathematical things. Uh, right? No, that's not true. I have to be good. So, um, you can plot this graph for any team dynamic that you want to measure and see it play out. So for this one, I said bond and performance. Now, for teams that have low bond and low performance, they have no reason to exist, please. They will be unproductive and nobody will get work done. For teams that have high bond, oh, we're all family, you know, we're all best friends in this team. But low performance emphasis, what will happen is that, you know, Few people will do the work of many because everybody is trying to be nice. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. So we're all family members who will come together and sing Kumbaya while some people are drowning with work and other people are coasting. All right. Then um, for th teams with low bond and high performance emphasis, what tends to happen is sharp elbows. People are in it for themselves. I want to get my job done and I want to move on. I don't care what you're doing or if you're able to get your job done. In fact, if you're not able to get your job done, that makes me shine. So I come into a meeting and I'm like, well, I mean, this is not ready because, you know, I tried my best. I sent three different reminders to this particular person, but they did not respond. They didn't get their job done, so I couldn't get my job done. Or I got my job done. What about you? Forgetting that we have team goals. But teams that have high bond and high performance emphasis are usually the most productive teams because everybody pitches in and, you know, we're able to get work done. And the focus is the same. Evolving team dynamics. So we're going to look at types of team models, stages of team development, different roles within teams and challenges in managing team dynamics. So let's get into it as quickly as possible. So types of team models. Now, because of the evolving way that organizations are working, we are moving away from just having functional teams within an organization. We've moved to having cross-functional teams. We've had self-managed teams. Now we have project teams and their operational teams and innovation teams. And in some organizations, all these types of teams coexist. And so the question now is, when I find myself within a particular team model or within multiple team models, how do I navigate? So understanding or situating yourself properly is the beginning or the first point of understanding how to manage team dynamics. So whether you're the team manager or you're the team member, we'll talk through some of the things that you can do uh, to manage team dynamics. So looking at it, we know what functional teams mean that, you know, they come together, similar areas of expertise, like the HR team in your organization or the IT team in your organization or maybe the investment team in your organization, depending on, on how your organization is structured. Then cross-functional teams will be members of different teams coming together. So in, in some cases, um, I'll give you an example. There's an organization that I worked with and the function was commercial, or well, the organization I currently work with, the function is called commercial. But then there are several, several teams within commercial. So there's marketing, there's sales, there's execution excellence, there's um, commercial excellence. And within these teams, there are sub teams. And within the sub teams, there are sub teams. So sometimes you have a large cluster, but people with different skill sets. So uh, cross functional teams. And then sometimes you have multiple people from different areas working together on a particular project or to deliver a particular result. So we've seen the different types of uh, team models that we have. Now we're going to move to uh, stages of team development. The way a group comes together can be demonstrated in five steps. Typically, the forming stage is when, okay, all right, the names have been announced. 15 people are going to join this project team. And the 15 people are Sunde from IT, Amina from strategy, uh, Uche from investment management. So you bring all these people together. 
forming, or even a new hire into your team is forming as well. Now, storming is when, hey, members of the group speak out like-minded members. At this stage, conflict between different subgroups may arise. What does that mean? Storming is usually we tend to gravitate towards people who reason like us, who we have something in common with. And so this will begin to happen. And that's why some things have clicked. Okay, we've worked together here the longest. Or okay, we all attended the same university. Or okay, we all like the same type of sport. So storming will now begin to happen when all of you have found your clique and your cliques now need to interact. Norming will become, okay, so now we have established what a common goal looks like and we'll begin to work towards it. Performing is when we now put in the work. I say, okay, we need to begin to see the outcome. And then adjoining is when, okay, group goal achieved. And uh, it's time to go our separate ways, right? So this is typical in project teams. But if it's a functional team, you probably stop at the performing stage until somebody leaves. And then you go back to forming because somebody else has joined, right? So consideration of where the group is within a cycle can provide perspective on how you know team dynamics work. Uh, I joined an organization in January, a new organization in January. And so for me, it's been a forming, storming, norming phase. And uh, performing is, is beginning to happen. However, the fact that a team has reached performing stage does not mean that they cannot circle back to storming if you introduce a new project or a new idea or a new team member. All right, so let's move on. Now, this I like, different roles within teams, right? So each team has different members, and the different members play different roles. Because if everybody plays the same role, then we'll have problems. We'll all consistently have conflict. If all of, imagine we're all team members, and we all want to be the leader of the team. Then nobody is going to follow anybody. And then nothing will get done, because we're all situated quite comfortably within our egos and waiting for every other person to come to us. So it's important that, you know, there are different roles within the team just to balance the team dynamics. Now, as mentioned, not every team has all the roles. And, okay, yeah, so I just need to make that clear. Not every team has all the roles. And also, you may not necessarily function in only one role. Your role can evolve within a team. So you might start out as the um, subject matter expert and find out that you have to take the lead on certain aspects of the project. So your role will switch to leader or will be a combination of subject matter expert and leader. So what I'm saying is these roles are fluid, depending on what your team is doing, what stage your team is, and what is required for time to deliver the results. So now look at all of this. What's your role within your team? Are you an implementer? Are you an innovator? Are you the quality controller? Are you a support person? And the thing is, support roles are very much underrated. But if they are not available, things tend to fall apart. So imagine that you're supposed to plan an event. And then the logistics person decides to go on vacation or the person who's supposed to keep the shadow for, the, for everyone to ensure everybody is on task, decides not to get their job done. Things can always fall apart. Or are you devil's advocate? The one who's like, mm, not quite. Everybody's going this way. I'm going to go that way just to challenge everybody to think different. Or are you a combination of two or three? All right, so there's so many challenges that people can face managing team dynamics. And as the picture is clear, we have different worldviews. We have different thought patterns based on where we're coming from and the things that have shaped who we are as that today. So the assumption that everybody should agree with you is fundamentally flawed. Because I have a superior argument. You know, I've done this thing in my head. I've done the permutation combination and everything, and it all makes sense. So everybody must align with what I'm saying. It's fundamentally flawed because your perspective 
may be very, very different from another person's perspective. And I've had in some cases where I'm working with a team and someone has said, you want to say, you know what, deal with me based on intuition, instinct, and emotion. Logic doesn't always work. I'm like, huh? I'm not a witch. How am I supposed to know? But as we gain more experience working in teams, we begin to see that, you know, we understand how to manage different individuals differently. So personality types is one of the major, major sources of conflict within teams. And we, we all, uh, maybe I'm hoping that we have all interacted with some sort of personality tool or assessment. You know, there's the Mayor Briggs, there's the Thomas International, there's the, so there are different uh, personality assessments that you can take. There's, a, I think, insights as well. Um, so I, I encourage you to take one of those, not as an absolute uh, on defining who you are, but it's in understanding who you are right now. Because our personalities also evolve over time. When I started working, I was just, yeah, I had big dreams, big ideas, but I was not very, it's not like I didn't have the English words to express them. It was a confidence matter for me. And it took me a while to build up uh, the capacity to own my own story and be confident. And every other day, I'm still struggling with imposter syndrome. Right, because you're you're in rooms and you're asking yourself, should I even be here? So the question is not even should I speak, it's should I even be here? But I digress. Let's circle back. So personality type, you know, there's the the for Thomas International or the DIS model is the dominant, the influencer, the steady, and the compliant, right? But know your personality type just as a guide, you know, because um Sometimes it, it, it helps you explain why you reason the way you reason or why you react the way you react. All right, communication style. Hey, I'm blunt. That's just how I am. I will say it as I see. Excuse me. You are rude and unlikable. And it's the truth. So in communicating, we need to understand that communication is usually or requires um, being context, context appropriate. The way I will speak with my peers is very different from the way I will speak with um, people that I believe have gone ahead of me, with my elders. And even because of the social context we find ourselves, which is Africa, where respect is a big do, it is important that we situate, you know, our communication style with where we find ourselves. And nobody says be rude to people who are um, upcoming or you feel that you are senior to, there are ways to communicate respect at different levels and we need to understand this. Role definition. If you do not clearly define roles, people will fight over power. Ah, you are doing my job with your job or you are, you are infringing on my space or you are talking to my stakeholders. I've seen that play out several times. So it's important to have clear roles. So role definition can be a source of challenge for teams. Leadership style as well. If my leader is dominant, does not want, you know, has, is very opinionated, it will be hard to have a creative person within that team. But once both parties are self-aware, you are able to manage upwards and the leader is also able to manage uh, their, their, their subordinates. We'll look at some of those things. Uh, conflict resolution, how we resolve conflict or do not resolve conflict. In some settings, Conflict is just swept under the carpet. You know, let's imagine it never happened. And then um, skills, competencies, uh, talent engagement, and trust. And then change management. So let's begin to think within our context. Sorry, my very little stakeholder is around as well. You know, it's Saturday and we're all chilling. Oh, did I remember to mention that I'm the mom of three boys? Uh, yeah, so my stakeholders are around. Um, so... That's me one minute. Can we, can we just trust my mom? And so um, we're going to just look at, you see, team dynamics, even among siblings. Somebody's reporting somebody. And now I have to be a mediator between, you know, the go between, right? And sometimes it's you reporting somebody else because you have to deal with the team dynamics within your organization. How to improve team dynamics. 
Now, because we know that there are several challenges in managing teams, and we have uh, not too long to discuss, I should be rounding this up very shortly. So I'm going to be picking on two specific aspects, communication style and conflict resolution. And that's what we're going to be looking at really quickly. Okay, so the first part will be managing team communication. And, you know, various communication styles, failure to communicate effectively will lead to low performance. We know these things, so uh, you don't need me. Well, well professional individuals, Abby, or well, I shouldn't tell you. All right, so types of team communication styles. There's the dominant communication style. The person who just wants to, you know, they're very intense, they're efficient, they're focused, they're results-oriented, they're not very patient because they expect everybody to be performing at high standards. Now, if you have team members that are dominant, you know, you need to encourage them, challenge them to do more work because it's where they, they feel challenged that they tend to thrive, you know? But if you're a leader that has a dominant style, you need to also uh, understand that context is key and not everybody has the same experience that you have. So turning it down a little bit, being the last to speak, because what tends to happen with dominant leaders is group think. You said what you think, now everybody aligns with what you think and forget to come up with their own solution. So it's important to be the last to speak during meetings, allow people to express themselves before you come up with your own suggestion. Now, influencers, yeah, those ones are the ones with all the likes, the love, you know, everybody loves them because they're social people and they, they know how to charm others, influence others into getting work done. So they're the ones that, you know, are the, my darlings, they're the office, they're the office, uh, what's it called now? Uh, was, uh, oh, social butterflies, yeah. They're the ones who are, you know, at the heart of everything, the life of the party, but the ones who are also, you know, emotionally sensitive towards you. They always know what's going on with each person. They are deeply interested in people. And so people tend to follow them. People tend to listen to them. So if you're a team member and you're an influencer, then you can easily lose focus. So give them tasks that fit their skill set, tasks that require presentation, tasks that require physical interaction or, or even social interaction with other people, tasks that require bringing people together. Those are the tasks that you give an influencer. And if you're a leader and you're an influencer, to stay focused as well, you need to set clear goals and ensure that you track them and hold yourself accountable or ask your team to hold you accountable. Now, the consensus leader is, is someone who, who works hard to produce perfection. So they, they will take their time. They will learn a new skill if they have to, to ensure that their work is you know, top notch. Now, the thing with these people is they can be slow because they are trying to achieve perfection and a good portion of the time they don't want to work with other people because they don't want anything to stain their wives you know they don't want anything to touch their their work they want to have control over the work that they do so these team members tend to prefer you know objective be very objective with them be very clear don't say oh you 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 never respect other people they're like what does that even mean so give them specific examples to say, okay, in this situation when we were in a meeting, this is what you said to Sarah and she did not like it. So give them very specific feedback, you know, and um, give, them, give them clear guidelines and measurable feedback. Yes, got that. Steady, we need to quickly move so that we can take questions and all of that. Steady, the guys who are, you know, they are loyal, they are consistent, they have routine and they like their routine. You know, they don't want they don't want change. They don't want any shock to the the way that they have organized their lives. And if you're going to introduce change, introduce it incrementally, small, small doses of change. Don't just bring change on them like that. You know, you have to have change management skills to manage a steady person. And if you're a boss that is steady and you're managing a project, you need to also understand that dynamics of the environment will consistently change. So put together a framework that helps you to break down change into small bite size that you can manage. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Strategies for effective team communication. Establish clear goals and roles. Foster open communication. Don't foster gossip. 
you know, there was something my mother used to do when I was growing up that I now realize that can be good practice in some cases, not all the time. When I go and report my siblings, right there and there, she will call the person and say, hey, this person said you said, oh yeah, say your own. So that nothing is said behind anybody's back. But what I also realized is if not properly managed, the conflict can escalate. So that's why I said it's correct or right to do in some context, not every context. To understand the context of the people that you're dealing with. Understand if they have the emotional maturity to have open communication. Because some people, that one thing you said is why they are holding on to your life and destiny and promotion. They are holding you in their chest and they are refusing to let you go. They are carrying your matter on their head like gala. And they have said, no, this one is my own. I will not let this person go in my chest and my heart. You know, but it's important that we understand where our team is at and see if we can apply open communication, honest communication. So open communication is very different from honest communication. Open communication is everybody knows what everybody is thinking. Honest communication is I can have a one-on-one -on -one with you and tell you how I truly feel. So know what to apply, where and when. Build trust. How do we build trust? You demonstrate integrity, build reliability, and you know, encourage trust building activities and team bonding activities within your team. Please, if you've worked from January to May and you've not had a, an opportunity to bond with your team, now is a good time to, you know, chip in some sort of fun activity that allows you guys to come together in a setting that is not high pressure. It helps to build bonds. Embrace diversity. And there are different types of diversity. I find it cringe when a lot of organizations focus on, oh, male and female gender as diversity. And you're wondering what happened to neurodiversity? What happened to, to economic diversity? What happened to, you know, there are other aspects of diversity that we're not even considering. And some of them are already even happening in, within your organization. I'll give you an example. So we were feeling cool with ourselves that we had HMO for, you know, people in the organization and their families. You know, you have four children and yourself and your spouse. And we're like, yeah, we've done employee benefits. And then an employee walked up to me and said, I'm single. So while I, I understand that it's great benefit for me, can I enroll my parents? Can I enroll my friends? Why is it just like you're spending more on everybody else and you're spending less on me because I'm single? That was somebody's perspective. Somebody else came with, with the idea of, oh, I have aged parents. So when you think you're solving one problem, you might be creating unintended consequences with other uh, diverse groups within the organization. Just the same way people get, um, say, parental leave. I'm pregnant, I give birth, I get maternity leave. What about those who adopt babies? Do they also get maternity leave? So diversity plays out in different ways, shapes and forms, and we need to be conscious of at least a good portion of them. You can't be conscious of everything, but a good portion of them. And when it's brought to your attention, do something about it. Manage conflict effectively. Address conflict promptly. Don't let it fester. And create win-win uh, situations and promote collaboration within the organization or within your team. Don't, don't praise somebody for having sharp elbows because what you reward is what will persist within your team. All right, so we'll move quickly to managing team conflict. We're almost at the end of it, don't worry. Managing team conflict, yes. There will always be conflict, and conflict is not necessarily negative. Sometimes it could be positive if we constructively manage it. So conflict is inevitable, it's natural, and even healthy whenever people work together. Conflict can be an effective means of everyone growing and learning and becoming more productive and having a satisfied or satisfied workplace. All right, so um, strategies for managing team conflict. You know, avoidance is actually a strategy. Just saying, you know what? I'm not even going to engage. It's a strategy for managing conflict. Because sometimes in trying to prove a point, you make the matter worse, even if you're correct or if you, even if you're right, depending on the context. So sometimes avoiding the conflict in the immediate can be a strategy and say, okay, no, we'll take this up later. Smoothing it out, you know, 
downplaying the differences and trying to amplify the similarities can also be, be helpful. Sometimes you compromise. You're like, I can't get 100% of what I want and you can't get 100% of what you want. So can we do 50-50? Collaboration sometimes so that we're like, okay, you know what? This is what we're arguing about. How do we solve the problem? This is a source of conflict. How do we resolve it? And you bring someone ways to get it, uh, get it done. Confrontation sometimes is good. Healthy confrontation, please. Not the toxic type that says, oh, you're a bad person, you're an evil person. In fact, I caused the day I met you. You know, people say things like that and you wonder how. It is important that we are able to give constructive feedback. So I'm saying this is what you've done. And be very specific. Address the situation, not necessarily the person. Because once a person feels attacked, what tends to happen is they want to defend themselves. It's a natural instinct. And it will now become, you know, it, it can degenerate into something else. So plan your feedback. Manage it properly before you confront anybody. And be ready for any outcome. Because nobody has monopoly of response. The person can respond in uh, an accepting and positive way or can respond in a negative way. Anticipate both scenarios and choose your battle. Appeal to team objectives. Okay, guys, we are very, very different. Yes, I understand. But our goal is this. How do we achieve this goal together? Refocus everybody. And sometimes you need third-party intervention, like an arbitrator or a mediator for your conflict. Now, how to resolve conflict in a team? Create a healthy culture. I think we've discussed all of this, but just again to reemphasize, create a healthy culture. Learn to spot the early signs of conflict. Um, yes, body language. People are eyeing each other somehow, somehow. People are, you know, oh, ignoring, stonewalling, cold shouldering one another. You see that that's the beginning of a conflict. This conflict is starting to brew. So identify the early signs and deal with them. Deal with conflict promptly. Don't let it fester. Because what then starts to happen is people begin to imagine things and have different scenarios in their head. Something that was so little and so simple, people will overthink it to a point where it becomes a big thing, making a mountain out of a molehill. So it's very important that you address conflict promptly. Develop rules for handling conflict. So ensure that your team members know to listen to one another, to respect one another's points of view. So I don't necessarily have to agree with you, but I have to respect your point of view. That's completely different. And so in creating tolerance and team dynamics that work within an organization, it is important to know that we won't always agree. Our opinions will always differ. And it could be based on fundamental principles or trivial things. But I have to, as a matter of principle, respect your opinion because it's valid and you have a right to express it. Right? Okay, that one can be a bitter pill to swallow, but we need to learn that as a country, as a people, as managers. I don't have to agree with your point of view, but I have to respect your opinion. All right, never take sides. If you're managing the team, don't be seen as biased because then people won't trust you enough with the issues that they are dealing with. They won't trust you to resolve the conflict. Now, in conclusion, yes, because all good things have to come to an end. In conclusion, um, here are five books, four books that I will highly recommend when it comes to team dynamics. The five dysfunctions of a team, team topologies, why work sucks and how to fix this, no rules rules, Netflix and the culture of reinvention. Now, these are, are uh, materials that can help with understanding team dynamics, building better teams, high-performing teams, and ensuring that you know what we are working towards um, global organizational performance. And as a team, we're as productive as can be. So at this point, I will say thank you so much for listening to me.